Welcome to The Real News Network in Baltimore. I'm Kim Brown. Red flags are flying in the scientific community over pending Donald Trump appointments of climate change deniers in key roles, such as the head of the Environmental Protection Agency and in the Interior Department. Also alarming is Trump's possible plan to scrap the NASA Earth Science Research Division in favor of deep space research. Now, NASA is one of the world's renowned organizations on issues of climate change, whose purpose, according to their own mandate, is to, quote, develop a scientific understanding of the Earth systems and its response to natural natural or human-induced changes, and improve prediction of climate, weather, and natural hazards. Well, now over 2,300 scientists have now signed a letter, an open letter, uh, to President-elect Trump asking him not to cut funding for research or censor scientists. With us to discuss this is Dr. Kevin Trenberth. He is a distinguished senior scientist. He's also representing NCARS Climate and Global Dynamics Laboratory. He joins us today from Boulder, Colorado. Dr. Trenberth, thank you so much for being with us. You're most welcome. So talk to us um, about the, uh, the characterization of climate change by President-elect Trump and others as a hoax as something that is conjured up by the environmental lobby. It's, 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 it's a, been a way of politicizing science, and it seems that we only hear this sort of characterization when it comes to describing climate change, especially from those on the right. So how important is the research that the NASA Earth Science Departments do in terms of our national preparedness and awareness of climate change? Well, firstly, with regard to NASA, of course, their mission is not just uh, climate change. That's a very small uh, secondary part of it. Their mission is indeed to understand and explore planet Earth, the, the planet we live on, uh, how it works and, and why and, and what uh, uh, changes are going on, whether they're natural or whether they're from human activities. And there are many human activities that are uh, are changing the landscape, whether it's uh, farming or, or forestry or uh, all sorts of things. But the one which has the important effects on climate is the changes in the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, the burning of fossil fuels is increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by over 40% uh, since pre-industrial times, mostly in the past century or so. And we have very good evidence of all kinds, from observational evidence, from physical understanding, how it all puts together, to say that, indeed, humans are changing the climate, climate change is real. And then you can also ask the question, you know, what do we do about it? And that is one, certainly, where values come into play and politics comes into play. But there are many scientific aspects uh, that are strongly evidence-based to say that climate change is a real and, and it's a problem. So Republicans in Congress already tried to cut NASA's funding last year, but they weren't successful. So how long has this political, quote, war on science been going on here in the U.S.? And what do you think is behind it? It certainly goes back to about 2012 when some of the biggest cuts have occurred in NOAA. The pressure on NOAA uh, through the House uh, Science Committee led by uh, Lamar Smith. Uh, and, and so uh, NOAA at that time was proposing uh, a climate service uh, parallel to the uh, National Weather Service. And it was really more an organizational um, uh, approach to uh, bringing all of the things that relate to climate together. It was more, more administrative than anything, but the word climate stuck in somebody's uh, um, throat, and uh, as a result, uh, a big chunk of their portfolio was cut by something like 30 percent, and that affected basic observations of the ocean, for instance. And so it had an adverse effect, and, and it's been that way uh, ever since. And so uh, last year, as you said, it, it crept into some other areas, uh, potentially affecting NASA and also in the National Science Foundation, uh, affecting geophysics and social sciences uh, also in the National Science Foundation. And NOAA is the National um, Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. NOAA does a wide range of work. I, the, the one primary function that NOAA uh, seems to do for our country that comes to immediately to mind is that they're the ones that fly the, the planes into the hurricanes. Is that right? That's one of the things, yes. But they're responsible for all of the satellite pictures you see on television at night. They run the operational aspects of the uh, satellites, whereas NASA is more in the development phase and building new things. 
uh, but not so much in the monitoring phase. But NOAA does many other things. You know, they're responsible for all of the fisheries, uh, for instance, uh, and uh, uh, they're, they have very large um, uh, environmental information uh, service that uh, supplies all kinds of information to farmers and people in forestry and uh, all, other, uh, all other areas. And, of course, they run the National Weather Service. And so they are, they are responsible for all of the forecasts. Uh, often you'll see uh, television people issuing forecasts, but they're nearly always based very, very heavily upon not what the National Weather Service has put out. So, Doctor, so what needs to be done that the U.S. doesn't fall behind on climate change research? The U.S. has certainly been a leader in, in many areas, but this is a global problem. Uh, satellites have the advantage of being able to see the entire Earth from space. And so this is the wonderful thing from the monitoring satellites and, and what NASA does. But there's a lot of uh, what we call in situ, uh, in place uh, observations, thousands, uh, actually tens of thousands of weather stations around the world measuring temperature and precipitation and winds and, and cloudiness and so on. And many of these are, of course, extremely valuable for uh, especially people who are growing things, farmers and so on. And uh, all of this information has to be gathered together and processed. And it's, amaz it's an amazing system when you see it all. And so uh, a, a lot a lot of this information that is gathered for weather is then used to try to put together the story about the longer term variations, the annual cycle and the changes in climate over time. Uh, some of the observations are not very suitable for that because they're not stable enough, but some of them are very useful and uh, there have been many reconstructions of, of what the climate is actually doing over time and so we have pretty good information about that, but there are all kinds of uh, interesting uh, complications that, that matter, especially with regard to water, precipitation, rainfall, uh, things like uh, storms, how they're changing. Uh, think of uh, Hurricane Matthew that uh, caused tremendous flooding in the southeastern parts of the United States, as an example. You know, it probably had a climate change component, but it probably had a very large natural variability component as well. And understanding that and what it implies for the future is what a lot of climate change research is all about. So, Doctor, talk to us about Donald Trump's policies and how they would affect public health and how uh, American society would suffer if climate science research funding is slashed under a Trump administration. Well, climate change is happening. And it, it's now quite substantial. As I mentioned before, carbon dioxide has increased by more than 40 percent from pre-industrial levels. And at the rate we're going, you know, we will double the amount of pre-industrial carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by about 2060 or thereabouts. And going along with that, there are substantial climate changes. The global mean surface temperature will go up by about uh, 3 degrees Celsius, um, you know, over 5 degrees Fahrenheit. And that that's judged to be in the dangerous level because it's at a level where many ecosystems, many forests, and all of the farming that we do would no longer be viable where, where it currently exists. And so this has uh, huge threats for many, uh, uh, many countries around the world. It's a, it's a global problem in that regard, and the U.S. Uh, needs to play a leadership role in two ways. One, because it's been responsible uh, more than anyone else for the problem by putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than anyone else. And secondly, uh, because uh, of the, the leadership that's needed in, in getting solutions as to how we address this. And all of this came together uh, late last year uh, in Paris, the so-called Paris Agreement, where uh, President Obama and the uh, current administration played a substantial role in bringing that agreement into reality. And it was a remarkable agreement of over 190 countries to develop a, a consensus statement that we really need to address uh, climate change in a substantive fashion. So regarding the letter that the 2300 scientists have sent to Donald Trump asking him not to cut climate research funding, one of their main demands is that research such as on the climate be divorced from political considerations. Is that even possible? And if so, Dr. How? Well, this was the approach that was adopted in the first uh, Bush, the Bush senior administration, that uh, we de definitely need information. 
We want information on what is happening and why and what the implications are for the future. And these are all scientific questions, but they depend very much on tracking what's going on, on monitoring uh, the, the weather and the climate around the world and, and uh, trying to understand just what is going on and why. And then a separate question is, well, what do we do about this? Do we try to plan for what we think the consequences of this are, or do we suffer the consequences? And the more we ignore this problem, the more we go in the direction of suffering the consequences. And we can already see the effects of this around the world in many instances. I mentioned before Hurricane Matthew, and before that, there was all of the floods in Louisiana that uh, undoubtedly had a climate change component as well. And you can go back to things like Superstorm Sandy. There was undoubtedly a climate change, a significant climate change component in that as well. And so there are big costs, tens of billions of dollars a year in the U.S. and around the world already associated with climate change, but it doesn't affect everyone all at once. It, it's a hit and miss thing. It affects different communities, different towns, different places at different times. In the West, it's been much more a story of drought and, and wildfires, which also have a climate change component to it. And so we really do need to plan for these consequences as best we can, and there's various scientific approaches to addressing that. One approach you end up taking is, of course, the responsibility of all of us, and it ends up uh, being in, very much in the hands of, of politicians. Uh, and so part of the objections seem to be that they don't want government, or some people don't want government involved in this, and yet it's, this is very much a national and international or global problem. It's one which is very much, in, in that sense, something which governments need to be involved in. If not governments, then, then who <laughs> would, would uh, be, ha have the ability uh, to take on such a monumental issue, such as uh, global climate change? Yes, well, it relates to agreements, and, you know, the United Nations is not a strong body. It's, it's not a governing body in that regard. Uh, the Paris Agreement that occurred late last year was, uh, was quite remarkable, but it has no enforcement powers at all. Uh, it, it's an agreement for everyone to sort of do their best in many respects, and, you know, we'll try and provide information and, and keep checks on, on just how well we're doing. Uh, and, uh, and and things like that, but um, uh, there's no there's no enforcement for for that. There's no uh, international governing bodies, and so it's very much up to countries like the U.S. to play a leadership role in this. The U.S., uh, China, and and Europe uh, together uh, can uh, potentially lead uh, lead lead our way out of a, a big a lot of a lot of this problem and uh, put us on a much better basis uh, in terms of um, where we stand with regard to the environment and climate we've been speaking with dr kevin trenberth he is a distinguished senior scientist at ncar's climate and global dynamics laboratory he's been joining us today from boulder colorado dr trenberth thank you so much for joining us oh you're most welcome and thank you for watching the real news network